because I absolutely love wildflowers. Oh, thanks, Kat. And um, we call this period of time in my house exam season because when we go out, I'm always spotting things and saying, oh, what's this? What's that? Um, so this is a really good time of year because the flowers are now emerging. The flowers that I have chosen are ones that you can find in uh, urban areas. So you'll find all of the ones on my list just about around Exeter, in the fringes, around Plymouth, as well as in towns and out into the countryside. So hopefully all of you will be able to spot some of these today if you go outside. So on my list is Red Campion, Stitchwort, Red Valerian, Herb Robert, Hedge Bindweed, Wild Strawberry, Scarlet Pimpernel and Dog's Mercury. And something else I just wanted to point out to you is when you start to spot things and try to work out what you're looking at, we uh, generally kind of push people to look at the different features. Um, so the features will be for plants, uh, things like the colour, the size, the shape, uh, what the leaves look like, and also the habitat, where does it like to grow? But not all of these features are important. So I'm not going to talk about every single one. It's just there's some key features. So as an example, on the right, the key feature to this plant is the leaf. As soon as you see that leaf, you're like, that's it. That's the strawberry. So that's the thing that I'm going to be really focusing on are those quick key features you can look at to help you spot something. So we're going to start with red campion. This is everywhere in Devon at the moment. It's absolutely sunny. So this is a lovely wildflower. It's uh, called red campion, but as you can see, it's a bright, bright pink. You do get a bit of variation. There's a white one and they do uh, mix together. So you sometimes get some paler ones, but generally in Devon, you get this lovely pink one. So some of the things to look for is the red campion has five petals, but they are split. So I've tried to do a little crude drawing of that top right to try and show you that's one petal and it looks a little bit like a heart, but they have five petals all the way around. And then something that's really important to help spot them is behind the flower on the picture on the left, there's something that we call the bell. It's this big bulbous thing. And that really helps you know that it's a red campion because it has this bulbous bell at the back. It's also quite tall. It can grow up to a meter and you find it growing in hedge banks and verges, woodland areas and shady areas. And you do get it growing in clumps together. So there'll be quite a few of them generally all together. Uh, I also have a picture of the stem. So it's a slightly hairy, sticky stem, and then it has large, uh, large oval leaves that come to a point and they're opposite each other. So if you see on the stem, uh, there's always a leaf next, uh, either side of each other. They're not alternating or zigzagging up the stem. So that's red campion, pink, woody banky areas, has the bell behind and uh, grows up to a meter. The next one is stitchwort, which also is ever at the moment. It, I think it started two or three weeks ago and uh, it will flower, uh, it's a bit shorter. So red campion will flower all the way through to September where stitchwort is more of a spring flower. So kind of May and June. It also has the split petals. So it's white and it's got five petals that are split but it doesn't have that bulbous bit behind. So I'll show you a picture of the back in a minute. Um, in medieval times, stitchwort was thought to help ease the pain of stitches. So they used to mix it with um, uh, acorns and wine to make a remedy. And I think the wine actually might be the key part of the remedy, but that's uh, linked to its name of stitchwort. So here it is from back, from the back, you can see it doesn't have that bulbous bit behind. It has long thin stems and also the leaves are different from the campion. They're long and thin and tapered. It's quite fragile. So if you pick the stem, uh, it would wilt 
instantly it's not something you can pick and uh, put it behind your ear it will kind of wilt straight away but it does uh, grow in the same place as red campion and you do again get these lovely patches of it so uh, when I was driving to the pool yesterday I noticed lots of it growing in the hedgerows near Exmouth. The next one I have is called red valerian this isn't native, it's actually from the Mediterranean, but it came over in the 16th century and it is really common. So you see it growing out of people's walls in lots of urban areas. It grows also out in craggy cliffy areas. Uh, it doesn't really grow in soil. It likes kind of really dry, dry stone walls that you'll find it in. It's quite tall. Uh, it's very pink, but you do again get variations of this rich pink on the left to a paler pink, and there are some white versions as well. Uh, butterflies particularly like it, or any of the pollinating insects with a long tongue, because they need to get in to pollinate it. Um, and it has lovely kind of bluish green leaves, which you can see in this picture to kind of quite triangular leaves that come to a long thin point and it has very soft toothing around the edge but it's a lovely bluey green color and you'll see this everywhere it's a very common flower next is herb robert and this is a favorite of mine um, people do get this confused with the red campion and when i explain the differences you might say oh why they, they sound quite different but sometimes when you're in the field you, all you see is it's five five petals and it's pink and they uh, kind of look a little bit similar um, but there are some things to really help uh, not get them confused so Herb Robert has five pale pink petals they're not split the flower is a lot smaller so it's less than a 5p in size it doesn't have that bulbous bell behind either and its leaves are like geranium leaves because it's from the geranium family. It also has a red stem which you can see in the picture of the left. It grows a lot in people's gardens, I have lots of it here um, and some of it I'll pull out uh, because it's in the way and some of it I'll keep in a bit of a non-cultivated area because it's good again for pollinators. Um, it does go a lovely fiery red in autumn um, and in medieval times because of that colour change, that red, uh, they associated that with blood. So they thought that it would help stop blood flowing. It was really interesting why they would think that. Um, another thing about it is if you do have it in your garden, it does, um, it seeds when it disperses and they kind of explode. So it will go everywhere so it does kind of keep coming back so if it is something you don't like once you've got it it's a bit of a pain because it will keep coming back once the seeds have gone but it's a very a very pretty little flower next we have hedge bindweed um, and a friend of mine said to me growing up they used to call it grandma's popping beds because if you hold it at the back you can squeeze it and the flower just pops out um, which is interesting. The flower is uh, this lovely white, it's quite big, it's a trumpet shape, and it has uh, these lovely leaves that are arrowhead shaped. It climbs and it climbs anti-clockwise and it can be a bit of a pest again because it is a very, uh, it's very successful climber and it can swamp things. But you will see it growing in the wild, in hedges, in banks and woodland areas and it has got these very large white flowers. There's a similar bindweed called field bindweed but the difference is the flowers are slightly smaller and they have this nice blush pink whereas the hedge bindweed is white. It has quite shallow roots um, so if you do get it in your garden and you don't want it it's quite easy to pull up but it does, uh, if you just leave a little bit, a little bit of root, it will start again. Um, so some people will see it as a pest, but sometimes it does look lovely growing kind of in footpaths along hedges and things and all intertwines into hawthorn and uh, willow. And it just looks lovely growing as well. 
And this flowers um, again across from about now to September. It isn't scented, but it is uh, pollinated by a type of hawk moth that again has a nice long tail to get right into the back of the trumpet. Next is the wild strawberry. And I chose this because I do see it quite a lot when I'm out walking and in urban areas when you're kind of going off into those scrubby paths, you do see it growing sometimes in the banks. The main feature for the wild strawberry is the leaf. So if any of your gardeners and grow strawberries at home, wild strawberries do have very similar leaves to the strawberry varieties you grow at home. It's smaller and it has smaller flowers. So the flowers have five white petals and a yellow center, which will become the fruit, but it's a lot smaller than uh, an actual strawberry that you would grow at home. The fruit is on the left, it's a very small little dry strawberry. Um, lots of people like to eat them. Personally, I think uh, shop-bought strawberries are a bit nicer and uh, it is very small, but that's what the fruit looks like. And it does have these um, runners like uh, garden strawberry varieties that come out as well. But you're really looking at that leaf. It's very toothed, nice and glossy, um, and it's very similar to a strawberry leaf. And the wild strawberry has been used in a William Morris print from the 1800s. And this is his most popular print. I think it was one of the most expensive, according to the VNA website where I got the picture, but it's the most popular. And you can see those little wild strawberries in between the thrushes there as well. Now this one, Scarlet Pimpernel, is uh, not as common as any of the others I've shown you. So you will have to have a little look to find this one. And it is actually declining in the UK. Uh, it's quite a small one, but it's very pretty. And it doesn't grow in the shady areas like a lot of the others. It likes to be in the sun, in kind of dry areas. Um, the photo that I used to promote the events was from the ruins of a castle. Uh, here you can see it's kind of growing in dry gravelly areas. So the flower is quite small and the plant will only really grow up to 15 centimeters. So it's quite a small, delicate flower. It has five petals and then this lovely burnt orange color, not scarlet at all. Um, and you can see there the leaves are well, as well, are very small. Um, little round kind of heart shaped leaves and it does kind of kind of sprawl around on the ground um, but it is a very pretty one and it will start flowering next month and again go through the season to September so do have a look for that um, you will find it in kind of scrubby areas or kind of uh, the old building areas as well and then the last one I've decided to include is because this is all over Devon, but I didn't know until I put the slides together that it's actually highly poisonous to humans and to dogs. So I think it's quite a good one to let you know about. It's called Dog's Mercury. It is up already, um, but it's not flowering quite yet. So it flowers in June. Um, you find it growing in shady woodland areas. Um, it does say on lots of the guidance that's generally in ancient woodland, but I've seen it in lots of woodland areas all across Devon, um, so do keep an eye out for it. When it flowers, it has this spike, and then it has these very small, cream, pale little flowers. But when you're walking along, you don't really notice them because they're quite small. Um, you just kind of see this spike with this fuzzy stuff on. It grows up to 15 inches and it does do a bit of a carpeting on the woodland ground. The leaves are shiny on one side and toothed again, so they've got lovely toothed edges. It has quite a strong smell and that's to attract midges. The midges pollinate it. So again, if you're, um, I attract midges, they obviously love the smell of these. So if you see dog's mercury and it's flowering, it's a uh, good to kind of note there might be a few midges around and you might want to put some insect repellent on it if it's a problem for you. 
So please do have a look out for this one and just be wary that it is poisonous. And if you touch it, you do need to wash your hands and maybe keep your dogs away as well. It's not something that we ever hear about reported in the news. Um, so I don't think it's uh, causing issues, but it's just good to know that this is a poisonous one. So those are the flowers I wanted to tell you about. I also wanted to uh, point you to some really good resources. Uh, so the book on the left is, um, it's not in print anymore in this format, but it's all over the internet secondhand. Uh, so it's the Collins Wildflowers Guide. And if you put in Collins Wildflowers W. Lippert, it will come up. I think someone's selling it for a pound on eBay at the moment. But what I really like for people who are just learning or they don't really need all the details, this is organized in the color of the flowers. So I have the book on my desk. And if I see a pink flower, I just go to the pink section of the book and then I can flick through and try and find a photo that looks like what I've seen. So it's a really good kind of introduction book. The one on the right um, is the one where I've got some of the uh, more interesting facts from. So again, this book isn't in uh, print anymore, but um, you can find it for sale on eBay and Amazon. Um, and this one has some of the meanings behind the names of the flowers. Um, and sometimes that's a really useful way to learn. Uh, so you might not always remember, oh, it's got five points or it's got a bell on the back. You might remember, oh, it's name. It was something that people used uh, to help ease stitches or something like that. So sometimes those little stories are really what kind of stick in your mind and help you learn. Um, so do have a look for those if you're interested. A lot of my wildflower guidebooks, so I've got quite a collection downstairs, I have bought from charity shops. Um, sometimes they're not as up to date or, you know, sometimes names have changed. But I do find you don't have to you know, buy the latest book. You can go and get one for one or two pounds from a charity shop and it's a good way to get you going. The other thing, a uh, resource I want to point you to is um, myself and Mike, who may have joined us now, we used to work at Plant Life and they have some fantastic spotter sheets. So if you go on their website and search for spotter sheets, they have them done uh, by the month or the season. So I think for winter, they just had a winter spotter sheet, but now they've got a March, an April, May, June, July, August, and it's an A4 spotter sheet that you can print out with some pictures and you can help you go out and have a look for certain ones as well. The next thing I wanted to say is a lot of the flowers I've just shown you are really good for pollinators, particularly things like the pink ones. Uh, red campion is loved by pollinators as is red valerian. So if you would like to learn a little bit more about some of the things you can do to help pollinators and what uh, flowers are really good for them, if you go to our website, uh, which is devonlmp.org, there's a section called Get Devon Buzzing and it's got lots of resources about pollinators. So please do have a look, there's some really good advice on there. And then finally, my last kind of plug for Naturally Healthy May, um, you, if some of you may have come to all of our talks, so you've learned about some of the birds, some of the trees and some of the flowers. Well, we're running a photography competition in May with Active Devon um, and there's some lovely prizes and we would like to have photos that people have taken of them outside being naturally healthy, either of themselves. So there's a lovely picture top right of someone going for a swim or of the place that you like to be naturally healthy. So bo the bottom photo is the recycling crew at Bratton Fleming, and they're having a stretch before getting started. So this is the picture they submitted. It isn't for pro professional photographers. Um, a lot of the pictures have come off people's phones. So it, when, it's not about the quality of the image, it's the kind of story behind that we're really interested in. So please have a look on the Active Devon website and you can find out about the competition and it's running throughout May. So I'm gonna stop 
sharing and see if we have any questions from anybody. So if you do have any, please could you put them in the chat? No, I think, I think that's okay. So that's great. So um, I'm going to end the recording in a minute. But as I said, please do get in contact. Um, first, if you have any feedback, please do go on the DCC YouTube page in the next few days, because uh, we'll put all the videos up there. And then if you do have any questions, please do get in contact. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.